Right. Yeah. So we have a three foot dummy of Kanan's book. This is the first time anyone's going to get to see the cover. Um, and I'm going to let Kanan do the honors of unveiling Thank it. you. We can do it together. Also, right. if you were sitting in the audience before, they kind of... <laughs> <laughs> They put the dummy way before the thing to cover it. So all of you have seen the cover. But pretend to be surprised. But pretend to be surprised. Pretend okay, give me like a big ooh. Okay, ready? One, two, three. three. Oh. Wow. wow. Crazy. Oh, it's beautiful. All of the books are this size. It's proving to be a logistical challenge. But I hope you guys buy at least 10 copies each. Thank you very much. He's going to be carrying it around all throughout the event. So yes. you'll see him yes. with it. Yes, absolutely. Right. I'm going to take Okay, it. so I'm not, uh, while Tashan gathers the notes, I'm not sure exactly how funny I'm supposed to be at the Bangalore Lit Fest. So I'm going to play it by ear, okay? Don't get bored. Be enthralled. All of you here have come in the capacity of very important literary thinking people. Okay? So uh, lean back in your chair, raise one eyebrow, <laughs> and get ready to say stuff like, yes. Inventive. You just have to nod wisely. I think. Nod that's, wisely. That's the main thing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Hmm. Karan, hi. hi. Lovely to be in conversation with you today. It's my pleasure, Tasha. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for coming out very early in the morning. It's very early for me because I'm a writer. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear. There is electronic dance music playing. Yeah. Okay. So someone is, is this yesterday's party still <laughs> going on or this morning's party? But yes. Right. So obviously, Kanan, you're hmm. a very fam famous comedian, uh, but we're talking to you today <laughs> in capacity as an author, right? Yes. So I think the first question I really want to ask you is... <laughs> Go on. Look very beautiful. <laughs> uh, the first question I really want to ask you is, when did you decide to be a writer? How long have you wanted to be a writer? What does that journey look like? Thank you very much for your question. <laughs> I will answer this honestly, okay? So, I feel like that's important for me to do. I'm struggling between my personalities about which one to present here today. So, I've settled on one in the middle. I have not ever decided to, be a, to write fiction. I think fiction just chose me as soon as I was, as soon as I could write. I think as invention always came to me and that being in the written word was just one of the ways, it was the most captivating way and the most immediate way. I think my family, uh, once a year we do spring cleaning, yeah. where we throw out everything that's important and keep like <laughs> receipts from Cafe Coffee Day. <laughs> and so in that, I think we discovered an essay I'd written in first standard and it was, uh, it was like write about your mother or something. And I'd written, I don't know if you remember, I'd written my mother is a very wonderful singer and already you can see the fiction because <laughs> <laughs> My mother is a terrible <laughs> singer. And she's, she's wonderful. She's right here. But <laughs> uh, and um, I think over time, I don't know if you had this experience. Every time you were allowed to write, mm -hmm. so there was a creative writing competition yeah. or there was an English language composition and you were expected to make, I used to look forward to it so much. So I could write it and then I could show my friends and people would say, very good, good job. And only like after many years, I realized I can do that in my free time also. It's... <laughs> I have permission to do so. It's allowed. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've been writing fiction uh, for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to, I don't know if anyone here has read, used to have a blog that was reasonably popular uh, with 12 readers. And That's huge. That was huge yeah. at the time. That's fantastic. In the early noughties, that was huge. Yeah. And so I think uh, my whole life has been some sort of uh, leading up to this. Yeah. Until I felt like I was worthy of writing a novel that I myself would enjoy. And yeah. That's so crucial, right? Giving yourself permission to set down the words on the page and do the novel. Yeah. Like ne negotiating that sort of power and authority is always key yeah. at the center of it. You know, there's an extreme panic. Every time you set yourself, so if you have to write 500 words, you're like, yeah, 500 words I can write. 1,000 words, 1,000 words is also okay. Then someone says 110,000 words. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're faced with, anything can happen at any point. You're faced with the enormous beast of possibility. Yeah. And so only when you feel confident enough to say, this is what should happen, instead of, have I made the wrong decision about what's supposed to happen in chapter 14, uh, is when I felt I was ready uh, to write a novel. Hence this. That's really interesting, though, because you can only know or be confident enough once you started setting the words down on the page, right? Yeah. So with this novel... 
talk to me about the process of it. When did the idea first come to you? What was it like giving yourself permission to sit down and do it? Or were you just one day right, right, I can do this, novel time, and sat down and just wrote a novel? I wish I was so cool. <laughs> no. I tried to write my first novel age 15, okay, in high school. And I never made it all the way through. I would get 75% way through and say this is garbage and start again yeah. and make it to the same point every single time. Yeah, always. So, um, on the way I found stand-up. And stand-up is really good because everyone, I think everyone in this room is, has a book right now. And by the way, guys, that's Pallami Chatterjee, the editor-in-chief of HarperCollins. <laughs> she would love to hear all of your pitches right now. <laughs> so, it's her favorite thing in the world, okay? So, if you want to write a novel, just go up to her right now and just tell her in detail. And she will 100% commission it, okay? <laughs> she told me to say this. Uh, <laughs> um, what was I saying? Yeah, <laughs> Just to, uh, when you start uh, deciding to finally write, ev I think everyone has a desire for prominence and a desire for creative output, okay? Yeah. And those two wires get crossed very easily. Mm. And uh, I really wanted to make something, but I really wanted also people to say that it was very Always. good. And uh, with stand-up, I found that immediately. When I do stand-up comedy, you're evaluated every seven seconds. Yes. If it's not good, you know right away. <laughs> <laughs> and if the audience doesn't think it good, it can't ever make it on stage. Yeah. And that was very wonderful and very fulfilling. Although I felt that there was part of me growing that I wanted to express myself in a way where you didn't have to stand up and applaud every seven seconds. Where I could take more time with emotions, where everything didn't have to be necessarily immediately funny in the simplest possible language. Absolutely. And so, I feel like uh, over the past like 11 or 12 years or so, where I've been professionally doing comedy, the literary side of me has been getting more and more unhinged. Mm. More and more willing to do something that is completely, mm. utterly experimental. Mm. And uh, so, building up to the idea of this novel, I decided to earn my novel writing shoes. Ooh. And the way I would do that is, uh, I saw Ray Bradbury had said this thing, that if you're afraid to write novels, write short stories. Write a short story of a week. That's 52 weeks a year. That's 52 short stories a year. And he said, I defy you to write 52 bad ones. Wow. So I said, fair enough. So 10 years ago, I said, not only that, I'll write two every day. Wow. And d deciding to not make them good at all. Yeah. I'll be like, nobody ever has to read this. I will write two short stories every single day. Thousand words, thousand words, done. Yeah. Then I start my day. I wake up, nah, nah, and then this happened, and then everyone died. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of first few years, everyone died. <laughs> it's a very good way to wrap up a novel. Always. Somewhere in the middle of that, I uh, was revising all these all short stories I wrote. I, because I assumed they were all shit. And I was reading some of them, and I came across two or three short stories which were kind of compelling. Yeah. They were written very poorly because I was sleepy or hungover or something <laughs> at the time. Or both. Uh, but I was like, this has promise. And somehow they all combined to form the nexus of what would be Acts yeah, of God. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting to me because, I mean, I know it's funny, but it's also a lot of discipline to wake up and write two shorties, stories every single day for a year, right? That, that's a lot. I am a computer science engineer. Yeah, <laughs> you've been trained. As everybody in this room. See, I did the arts. So my motto is always as slow as possible, as lazy as possible, as gently as possible. That's really wonderful, dude. But we were not given the option in college. We were not, yeah. You would really get beaten by... <laughs> and or then I worked in the software industry as well, where you just really had to do the stuff you were asked to do. There was no option. Uh, if you were smart and clever, you could find it... You could do it in an interesting way possible. But I'm very given to the idea of... Uh, I'll be disciplined. And the, uh, my, I find my favorite way of being is goal-oriented but free. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's really beautiful yeah. and it really gets stuff done effectively. Hopefully. Yeah. But I'm going to ask you the worst question you can ask an author. Go on. Which is, favorite you said color. nexus of the idea. <laughs> so, I mean, don't describe the whole book because you wrote a whole book for it. But basically, explain to the audience a little bit about what this book is about. And then I'd like to talk a little bit more about the process of writing it. So drafts, time, agony, pain, happiness. Shall I those. read something from the book? Yeah, go for it. This would be a really good time to have the book. <laughs> this would be a really good time for the... Uh, Mehtab Singh, my, there's one jhola backstage which has a <laughs> book inside it. I thought I should get a jhola because I'm a writer now. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, I bought a Japanese collar t-shirt. <laughs> 
I saw it last night at the party as well. Yeah, so I thought as a writer, I should uh, wear my glasses at all times. Have a Japanese collar t-shirt and a jhola. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is the book. This is advanced copy, not the cover. That's the cover. Okay. So instead of describing what the book is about, because the book is about far too many things to pin down, I was asking, uh, I was asking you, then I was asking Paulami as well, asking everybody involved, what should I read from the book? Okay, this is an enormously difficult challenge. And you were telling me that you've only ever made the wrong decision. Always, every single time. You're the worst judge of what's the best thing to read. Correct. So I first picked up uh, one paragraph yesterday and everybody was like, you want everyone to cry or what? And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> then I picked another chapter, they were like, this is too esoteric, Karan. And I'm like, arey, yaar. So instead of telling, the, telling you the plot of the book, let me tell you this. The first page of the book is storage instructions for this book. <laughs> the second page of the book is an allergen warning. <laughs> Let me read a little bit from the allergen warning. Allergen warning, page 9 in Roman numerals. <laughs> the author sneezed repeatedly, both on screen and paper during the construction of this book. Viruses wearing engagement rings on their heads battle brave bacteriophages between the words you read. The war between sickness and health is an invisible side plot only for our microscopic readers. Place your bets in soiled handkerchiefs. This novel is not for the feeble of spirit or people with better things to do. <laughs> Some parts of it have been written with an almost infuriating freedom. Speed readers have been unable to develop sufficient traction and book skimmers have reported digestive distress. As this novel comes pre-skimmed, with several bits containing 0% plot. <laughs> this novel may cause an urgent impulse to throttle the narrator. Must we spend 30 pages describing what this building looks like? Why can't you just get on with it? A dread may loom in, a, in the ominous onset of a huge windowless block of text. For that matter, one may wonder, why was any of this even written? To clarify. This book is not intended to be a page turner, but loud sighs near the corners of pages might flip them. <sighs> you are invited to experience this work as a cocktail going in or a hangover going out. You might feel a little sick, but you'll be fine. Either way, don't worry about it. That's the allergen warning. I can read the preface also if you want. Woo! Hangover going out is my favorite phrase. Shall I? Shall I? Shall I not? Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll read one more paragraph. Preface. Okay. By the way, in mentally, I say preface. I'm saying preface out loud. <laughs> I say poem and preface. Okay. <laughs> the author presents this preface to disseminate some important information, but primarily to annoy you. Prefaces are for cowards who like to present lengthy caveats to offset criticism. Like poets with more preamble than poem. The author submits that he is a coward and takes great pleasure in your displeasure. What next, you think furiously? A forward to the expedition? A note from the publisher? A smug introduction from a more successful author? <laughs> Actually, this goes on for a long time. So that's... <laughs> I should have just stopped. I should have stopped then. Thank you. Okay, so scrap the questions about drafts for now because when you read from the book, um, it struck me again, what I love so much about this book is the level of playfulness you have. Mm. There's so much lightness. There's so much experimentation. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, bravery is a strange word, but there's a lot of bravery for that first novel, right? You're doing whatever the hell you want on that page. Yeah. Um, was that hard to do? Was it hard to give yourself that sort of permission? A little bit. Uh, TB, very honest. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, because and I do love doing stand-up comedy, it has comes with a very rigid set of constraints. And like I said before, inside me, I was really willing to let loose and find an avenue to let loose somewhere. And so with this book, I uh, kept coming up against every creative block I ever had and dismantling it, which I thought was the only way to move forward. And I decided while writing the book that my fun is the process of writing the book. If I don't have fun now, I will never get to have fun with this book. The moment, like right now, book is already not mine. It's yours. I don't know what you'll think about it. Buy it, then think whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why uh, a, sense, a sense of freedom and the, a sense of playfulness was very essential to the form of the book, to the content of the book, is a part of my personality as well. And I felt like um, 
I'd be doing a disservice to myself if I wasn't completely as free as I wanted to be. I think that's brilliant. And yeah. I think that's really, really powerful because you can see it on the page, right? The book does whatever the hell it wants to do and that's powerful to Yeah, read. yeah. Um, so you mentioned comedy here, right? And I think for a long time, before I was friends with another comedy writer, I was like, oh, they just, they do their stand-up, they come on stage, they say it, it's yeah. all in the moment, it's immediate. But obviously not, right? You write those jokes, you plan that show, you do it extremely... Um, you test it out, right? And then you fine-tune it until yeah. you finally do it up in performance. But writing a funny book, and humor is so hard to do in a book, obviously you don't get to see audience reactions. You yeah. don't get to see how something like that works. How did you navigate that process of basically creating a static object, right? Mm. That will be experienced in different settings, different places, at different points in time, which is not a comedy show. People are coming in a very set place yeah. with a very set context. Uh, honestly, it's a great question. But it's like, uh, I was... While the book, I wouldn't say is a comedy per se. It has comedy, but it's not just a comedy. Comedy, a sense of lightness is the way I express myself in all mediums. And I always have. Yeah. Even in my uh, computer science answers. <laughs> <laughs> it was not appreciated. <laughs> um, and so, I think you generally have an instinct for there's a kind of freedom that you can offer even readers. Yeah. And it's the kind of, like I was telling you about your novel, um, Mad Sisters of Essie, HarperCollins 2023, please Call buy. Me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please buy immediately, very good. Um, it's that when you uh, see other people being free, it actually sets you free as well. Okay, you can have one of two reactions to something very experimental and very new, mm. is that you can be uh, inspired or frustrated. Okay, it's frustrating for people who have caged themselves. Yeah to see freedom, it's very annoying. You will hate this like anything you'll write, anything you'll do. <laughs> and if you are also just looking for a way out, looking for a key to your own cage, yeah. then something that is free, I think, is inspires you. So, to answer your original question, I meandered off, I think, um, is you have a, I think I have a sense of uh, what is good and more than uh, what is funny, I just want it to be, okay, what is the most fun I could have with this character in I this situation? That. That's it. I ask myself that all the time. And I tell myself as a mantra when I come on stage also, or I do anything, I'm like, okay, how could... And most things you have to do in your life are very annoying. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't mean this, but most thing, most in, everything in your life is a chore, actually. Mm. And so if you could tell yourself for just a microsecond before that, is there any way to extract fun from this situation? Usually there is. There's something you can do. You can put this thing on your head for just a little bit of added fun. And so that's what I told myself. Every page, every character, every situation. Can it, can it be more weird? Can it be more fun? Can it be more silly? I honestly love that because yeah. it's really hard sometimes to find, um, to find that joy in the writing process but also allow that joy to translate on the page for the reader, which Acts of God does, right? It's Thank got very that much. very much in there. Um, so talk to me a little bit. I'm going to keep questioning you as the writer with the eyebrow raised yes. um, on the side. Um, tell me a little bit about the drafts of writing this. What the, the eyebrow has to be raised. It's, the Sorry. effect is not there without the... <laughs> Go on, Tashan. <laughs> tell me a little bit about the drafts of writing this. Because I think there's a lot of lightheartedness when you talk, obviously. But there's obviously an incredible amount of hard work and sort of coming up against walls over and over again. And I find that's really interesting in the creative process. Like, what, what did you have to go through to get this? Because fun as it is to read and light as it is to read, it's not always the same in the actual act of creation. Yeah. So all my uh, literary heroes have changed a lot since college, okay? Mm -hmm. In college, my literary heroes were people who wrote one book and exploded. Okay, I, you really, I don't know, when you're a young person, you value self-destruction so much. You're like, wow, this guy was sad his whole life, crazy. <laughs> so true. Wow, he was an alcoholic, he shot himself in the head <laughs> and he wrote one book. Wow, what a genius. <laughs> and over time, especially trying to make a career in the creative field, you realize what you value is your own sanity <laughs> and your sense of happiness. So my literary heroes have changed very significantly to people who are good, but as well as prolific. Yeah. Okay, so my heroes now, P.G. Woodhouse has written more than 90 books. Brilliant. 90 books. <laughs> Insane. Uh, Stephen King wrote, finished one book today only. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brandon Sanderson, Ray Bradbury. So people like that. So I, I, everyone does this, but I really studied like, what is it about you? How do you think about this? What's, 
everybody is like, okay, what favorite writer routine, how much write every day. Uh, but I really found that they have a great respect, but a certain distance from their work. Yeah. Okay, you are an employee of your own creativity in some respect. And so uh, I decided to approach it as that. Um, the idea of for the book or whatever, I was very confident that something will come because something has been coming my entire life for 34 years. That's not the issue. The issue and the real the challenge for me is to let it happen. And so letting it happen is it's really an emotional journey more than the journey of discipline of letting uh, this happen. Is the work you have to do on yourself to not cut your ideas down before they are born. Absolutely. Uh, do revisions without telling yourself you're a piece of shit yeah. for having written it wrong the first time. And not be so insistently cruel to yourself, yeah. uh, which allows you, I think, uh, to be way more prolific than the person who spontaneously combusted after two terrific novels. Because really, the value of your life is the experience of your life, not the output of your work, according to me. No, uh, that's correct. Okay, 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 enough, enough. No, no need. I said it by mistake. <laughs> Acts of God available. <laughs> by 10 copies each, yeah. But you're right, like when uh, you're younger and you have literary aspirations, you're always looking for the tortured geniuses, yeah. right? You're like, if I'm not tortured, it's not going to be good. I just yeah. have to be deeply miserable. Like Because you're like, I have that in common with the genius. They're tortured genius, I'm yeah, tortured. I'm also <laughs> I'll get Very genius. close, right? <laughs> <laughs> Automatically, it's bonus points. Yeah. Like it has to come. Um, you mentioned P.G. Woodhouse, yeah. who I absolutely adore. He's the brilliant, best. he's the funny, greatest. he's light. Um, and I think he writes extremely connected to the real world in some sort of way, right? And I've watched your stand-up, and your stand-up is hilarious and wonderful, but also connected very much to the real world, right? Sure, there is fiction as part of it, but there are real people, real events. Uh, this is an SF novel. It's an experimental genre, madcap, crazy fun, but SF novel. What drew you to that genre in particular? Uh, the fact that we were talking about this a little bit off stage also. So now, Dashan, you also wrote Mad Sisters, yes. which is set uh, in an alternate reality. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's <laughs> spot on. Yeah. I wanted to say, well, I don't know how much I should give away about the veil and <laughs> the interconnected worlds. and Okay. So, but you also like, so I can turn the question back to you. Why would you choose such an absurd setting uh, for a novel? But I've answered this question many times. Why answer it? Answer today. So I think yeah. for me, it's a way to sort of get through to the essence of humanity so you mm. kind of take away the setting and the reality of it but that allows you to find what's relatable on a more deeper level and mm. doesn't allow in a way it doesn't distract the audience because you kind of get down straight to the essence and you yeah. put it in a context that allows them to see it more clearly than they would in an everyday life what about you same <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, I, you really aren't in charge of the ideas you have. Mm. No, you really, it seems like many times that I'll let me think and I'll have this kind of idea. Yeah. But you really don't have an idea before you have the idea. There's no place to stand to pull an idea. The idea is the first indication of itself. And so the idea came and I was like, here, here you go, man. <laughs> All you have to do, is, I think, is to staple together different ideas and cut them down to size. But the idea of this novel came to me. Let me tell you, I, every... So this is the first book that's being published, but I've written two more, uh, which will hopefully come out depending on your behavior. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but for each of them, I think I find uh, the commonality to be mm. that I've never decided what they would be about. They are just about what they're about. And I always start out wanting to write complete farcical satire. Every time, that's my intention. Yeah. It only ever lasts two chapters. Every single time after the third chapter, it becomes a deeply emotional <laughs> book. And I, I get so irritated with myself. I'm like, stop doing this. <laughs> you know, the things I get very annoyed reading on the backs of books is like a moving portrayal. <laughs> and someone About has written itself. heartbreaking. You're like, ah, <laughs> I don't want... <laughs> but um, what I've realized reading Acts of God, now this book has with me, been with me for three years. Uh, so three years ago, first, the first draft was finished is that you always think you're inventing something com completely fictional. And at the time, I was sure I was inventing something completely fictional. But the poor characters in this book are processing emotions that I have not in my actual life. Always. And now with some distance of it, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> what I was going through. <laughs> oh, 
So all this misery that I've assigned to these fictional people is actually I'm making them do my emotional work. And it's like therapy. Honestly, it's uh, cheaper. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yeah, so I think the setting of the world and the characters and what the book is about is in some way, sure, you're connected, your heart is connected to the magical means somewhere, yeah. you're hooked to the ether somewhere, and ideas flow, and it's magical and crazy and cool, and you, you have no idea what you're writing about. But actually, it's very much colored by your emotional state, and that's something that's unavoidable. Yeah. And it's really, you're offering people, whether you realize it or not, very private access to your heart. Yeah if you write something for a sustained period. You can't pretend any longer than a short story, I think. Yeah. Or even in a short story for that matter. Yeah. yeah. Also, you did it three times. Like, there's three books. That's amazing. Yeah, right now, there's one book. But, yeah. yeah, one book. Pre-order is open today. <laughs> I should have said that already. Sorry. Yeah. Um, huh. So, I think I'm sort of thinking a bit more about this book. You've done three. So, it sounds very much to me like this is, as you said, a process and a person you've wanted to be for a very long yes. time. Um, how did you sort of navigate the revision process? Because obviously, have you, you haven't trained in this, right? I don't think any of us trained in this. We all how make can it up. you? Yeah, yeah, we all make it up yeah. as we go along. Yeah. But was it sort of hard to navigate that revisions process? What did it look like? Give me concrete details okay, I can so write down. I have uh, no ego about my work. I mean, because it's st stand up is so brutal that <laughs> you really very quickly let go of any like notions of like I'm a genius actually. <laughs> uh, my goal is okay. I first first draft has to be honest, yeah. has to have no artifice, no pretension of like I want to be seen this way or I want people to think like what a smart intelligent book from a smart intelligent boy. <laughs> uh, uh, the revision process was I let it go for one year, and I saw many writers uh, talk about this, but. When you finish the book, you're so excited, you're like, just read it now. But everybody whose opinion I value said, just put it in your drawer for one year. Absolutely. And sure enough, if I read it a, a year later, I was like, wow, some of this is very self-indulgent. <laughs> 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 and so you realize some gaps, then you cut it out. And uh, I'm, I'm very hardworking, is something I can say about myself. Uh, I don't know if this is, like, everyone is hardworking, but uh, a diligent also. So I did three or four drafts on my own. And then when it went to HarperCollins, they would always highlight stuff like, this is too long. And I'd <laughs> send me email back, so what then? <laughs> <laughs> so what? It's so long, so what? <laughs> They'd be like, shorten it. I'd be like, you shorten it. <laughs> and we would meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, I realized that I have uh, some confidence, uh, some, a weird sense of confidence that I didn't know I had. But some parts, I'm like, no, this is essential. Yeah. Even if every single person says, these three pages you can remove, I'm like, no. Meanwhile, other paragraphs, I was like, yeah, this was just, I was hungry that day. That's why I wrote this. So. <laughs> yeah, it can go. The revision process has been uh, less painful than I imagined, actually. Uh, what's your take on the revision process? I want to throw any questions back to you, Dasha. Oh, I'm sorry. Before that, very, very considerate of me. Huh? Two minutes to go. Oh. So you have one question. I was just, would you let her talk, please? Yes, please. <laughs> go for it. The question first. I'm so sorry. I... Would you like us I would to, like to apologize. Up to audience questions? Don't think we'll have... We can That's probably what do I, I one think question. Can probably. we ask questions to the audience? Yes, you can. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, we've got two questions. Uh, we've got two minutes left. So let's uh, stay on time and wrap it up. Yeah, I think so. So I think my um, last question to you was um, planner and panster. Have you heard of those terms before? Uh, I have uh, different versions of the architect and gardener. And yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Which I'm, I think I have a guess which one you are, but which one are you? I uh, make it up as I go along. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then in the revisions, you just kind of trim all the chaos down. Yeah, so every day, keep a notebook at the side and be like, okay, this character has not shown up in four... I think this character should go. <laughs> four chapters earlier, you write like, and then she was there. And then later, you're like, oh, she's not come back only. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think it's exciting to make it up as you go along. For me, I don't know uh, what your process is, but uh, I like to sit every day and be like, what are they going, how are they going to get out of this mess? Let's find out. Yeah. I think it's really, truly beautiful that you've given this book full permission to be what it wants to be. It's a brave experimental novel. That's just an insane amount of fun. Pre-orders open today. Please go pre-order it, guys. It's absolutely fantastic. Congratulations, Karan. Thank you very much.